We're good. We're recording. So, do you want to use this? Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. Turn it on. I guess. You can take this one with the other. Oh yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. It says Q and A. Okay. Right. Well, we'll get started. It's just gone six o'clock. Thank you all for coming out this evening. I know there's a lot of other interesting activities happening in Old Lyme this evening, although I only just found out about them. <laughs> um, this is our last SECWAC meeting of the current season, 2021-2022. We'll start again in September. Um, we're actively working on a program for then. Um, and we're probably going to continue with the combined in-person Zoom because frankly that's what we've discovered in the last few months with our in-person events that we're still we still got quite a following on zoom so we probably will have to do that hybrid thing until people get fed up doing uh, zoom doesn't look like it's going to happen for a while um i'm usually it's rick stout who's doing the introductions uh, the chairman of sacwack but he can't make it today so i'm going to do the introductions and then I will introduce Liz Lightfoot, our board member, who will introduce the speaker. I just want to tell you about a couple of other items. Um, although this is the last American official SECWAC people, meeting, yeah. I do want to remind you about our Great Decisions collaboration with the Waterford Public Library. Uh, we've been meeting on a Thursday, just a small group. There's a few SECWAC members turn up. It's mostly uh, library patrons. Um, and we've had, we're going to have We've had three of four uh, experts come and speak on the topics of great decisions. So just to remind you, great decisions, there's 10 or 12 essays every year produced by the Foreign Policy Association. Um, you, the idea is you read the essay and um, then you discuss it just amongst yourselves. We, I, I, we, I've managed to bring some experts. We had a gentleman from the State Department that talked about Myanmar. We had a young lady from um, the Nature Conservancy talking about climate change. We had Peter Rutland from uh, Wesleyan talking about Russia. And on June 30th, we'll have Peter Beinert on Biden's foreign policy. And Beinert actually spoke at SECWAC a couple of years ago. Uh, he's often has uh, op-ed pieces in the New York Times. He's a very um, interesting character. Um, so if you are interested in attending that, it's free. Um, you don't even have to be a SACWAC member. Uh, you just um, register at the Waterford Library website. Um, and then we will continue with the Great Decisions Program in 2023. Um, uh, let me see what else. I also want to thank the Chamber of Commerce of Eastern Connecticut. Um, with whom we have a business arrangement. And I especially want to thank Rachel, who's walking out of the room, because Rachel is back with us as the uh, chamber uh, liaison, and wonderful to see her back. And I also want to thank Rob Lloyd at the back, who has uh, helped us with all the techie stuff, since this is the last meeting of the year. Um, and you will be hearing, keep an eye out on the SECWAC website, uh, and we will print the little postcards when we have a new, uh, schedule up but we will begin in september i don't know the date yet and that first meeting will also be our annual meeting when you get to hear a little more background uh, but without further ado i want to introduce liz lightfoot from the board to introduce our speaker took the republican delegation to the oval office to richard nixon Basically Thank you, Paul. Hi, everyone. I have, it's so fun to see uh, some family members and friends here. Um, but the one I'm really excited to see is our speaker, Ted Bacone, who is um, somebody I've known, I think I was figuring this out for 34 years, just about. And 32 years ago, um, Annie over there and Sarah and Ted's wife, Susan, walked down this aisle to um, at, at my wedding to my husband. And so Ted was here and, and John, I think you, Ted was saying you were sitting maybe in the second row over there or something like that. Um, anyway, so this is for me, this is such a wonderful um, occasion to have um, old friends together, but it's also incredibly exciting because although I've known Ted for 34 years, I've never sort of experienced the, the work side of his life, except once when we got to go to the Easter egg roll at the White House because of Ted, that was really, really exciting. Although I, our whole family couldn't go in. So I was outside with our youngest um, and we could see over the fence. It was very, it was great still. So. Anyway, Ted, I've always known was a remarkable person making a huge difference in this world. Um, 
And it's so wonderful uh, to read about all that he does. And, and I really look forward to hearing more. Um, Ted is currently, he's the Chief Engagement Officer at the World Justice Project, where he leads the organization's efforts to advance the rule of law through st strategic partnerships and convenings, coordinated advocacy, and locally led initiatives around the world. He has more than 30 years experience in international relations, policy, and law. Most recently as a senior fellow specializing in international, law, uh, international order and strategy in Latin America at the Brookings in Institution. Currently, he serves as a non-resident senior fellow in the Center for Security, Strategy, and Tra Technology in the Foreign Policy Program at Brookings. And if any of this is not current, you correct me, please. Um, during his 11 years in residence at Brookings, um, he, in, in addition uh, to, this is something I edited as I was in the car and I can't read it, but in addition to serving as a senior fellow, um, he was the Robinson, uh, Charles W. Robinson Chair, appointed the inaugural fellow of the Brookings Robert Bosch Foundation Transatlantic Initiative in Berlin, and served as the acting vice president and director and deputy director of the foreign policy program. He's the author of Five Rising Democracies and the Fate of the International Liberal Order, which examined the trajectories of India, Brazil, South Africa, Indonesia, and Turkey, and also of Catalysts for Change, how the UN's independent experts promote human rights. He's edited multiple volumes and articles on foreign policy, Latin America, and human rights, and has served as a senior foreign policy advisor at the White House, hence the, the, the tickets to the Easter egg roll, um, and served on the National Security Council staff at the State Department's Office of Policy Planning and the Office of the Secretary of Defense at the, at the Pentagon. He's a graduate of Columbia Law School and the University of Pennsylvania. And I can also say that he is a wonderful friend, a wonderful husband, and a wonderful dad. Um, it's been such a joy to share um, our, our, well, we used to share summers together or a, a week each summer together um, with our extended families and our children. And we don't do that anymore, but it's always so fun to get together. And I'm so excited to hear about your work. And I should also say that Susan's wife, Susan, Ted's wife, Susan, is, is a remarkable person in her own right. And she's in Turkey at the moment. Um, I assume you'll talk a little bit about what she does, maybe not, but she's a powerhouse too. And I'm so blessed to have you as friends. Thank you for coming from DC. Thank you, Liz. That was really, really generous and touching, and it's really an honor to be here. Um, here we are on the eve of summer solstice, so it's nice that you took time out of this beautiful weather to come and, and think some big thoughts and hear a bit about where we are at this moment in, in history. It's, it's a fairly dark moment, and I'm going to say a few things about that and try to end on a note of optimism. Um, so, and also thank you, Paul and, and Scott. I don't know if he's here. I haven't met Scott yet. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, all of you for coming out. I'm just gonna put this here. Okay. Um, I will not put that there. I just wanna roll off, thank you. So as, as Liz pointed out, I'm, I'm wearing two hats. I, I, um, am running our kind of outreach and engagement strategy work at a project called the World Justice Project, an offshoot of the American Bar Association. And I'm still affiliated with Brookings and doing fun opportunities like this to think and, and speak. Um, so I've spent a fair amount of time thinking and writing and trying to also be an actor, an activist in, in this whole space of democracy, human rights, rule of law, and international affairs. And I think my comments this evening reflect that experience, um, but also, I mean, reflect the moment we're living in. I think this audience online and otherwise in here are already very well informed about what's going on in the world. Um, all you have to do is open the newspaper every day or in the news and see just how sad uh, the current state of the world is, particularly on issues that I care about, we all care about, I think as Americans, democracy, human rights, and, and rule of law. And it's a problem both here in the United States and around the world. And I'll say a little bit more about the evidence for that uh, later. But I also wanna speak frankly on a more personal level about this dangerous moment we're living through and what it might mean for the quality of life that we've enjoyed and we hope our children and grandchildren will enjoy in the future, but which feels to me increasingly out of reach. 
and I, I, do, I really don't say this lightly. I am by nature an optimistic person and I've pursued my interests in law and international affairs with a positive but realistic attitude about how to make change, meaningful progress and change. And I think there's a lot of evidence for that optimism. I mean, history teaches us that in this eternal tug of war between our human traits of goodness and compassion on the one hand and aggression and greed on the other, we've managed not only to survive, but to improve the lives of more people than ever before on this planet. And you can point to lots of, of data points. So if you measure it by rates of life expectancy, maternal and infant mortality, education, income per capita, gender parity, and lots of other criteria, the world is a much better place today than it was 50 or 100 years ago. And I argue that one reason for that is, is, is the victory of democracy over fascism in World War II. And that seminal event of the past century set in motion a series of international actions that led to the construction of what our current Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, refers to as the rules-based international order. I, in my book, talked about the international liberal order. It's really, we're talking about the same thing. And centered around the United Nations and the Bretton Woods institutions and many, many other uh, regional and global institutions that we've created over the years. At, at the heart of this, what I will call global governance structure, not global government, global governance structure, is this pragmatic set of beliefs that under our system, Westphalian system of, of nation states, sovereign nation states, we can protect and even promote our national and global interest only through some level of mutual cooperation. That is how we can um, improve our lives, but also when that's not possible and there's direct competition and even military conflict, um, that it would not lead to full-blown war, uh, let alone nuclear war. So we can manage this through a whole series of treaties and diplomatic arrangements and intersecting ties and trade. Can, can um, you mute it just for while he's on break? So, so I can see if so I get this. Trouble. This is the post-war consensus out of World War II, and it has been tested over and over again uh, through the Cold War, the Cuban Missile Crisis, a series of regional conflicts, uh, terrorism, many uh, economic crises, to name a few. So looking back, to the 1990s when I joined the Clinton administration, um, I, we as a country were embarking on a new and even more hopeful chapter in this, what is a relatively short story of, of international peace and, and security. So throughout the 90s, remember this, it was a hopeful time, democracies were on the rise, military dictatorships in Latin America were on the run, Dictatorships in Indonesia and the Philippines were collapsing. Apartheid in South Africa was expiring. Colonialism was dying. Economies and trade were liberalizing and globalizing and technology was seen as a force for good. So this, this wave that I would say continued crested in about 2000 was the basis for a lot of new thinking in Washington about how we could knit together a coalition of democracies to turn the tide for a long time in the direction of greater respect for human rights, for rule of law and democratic governance. And at the heart of that, another piece of that revolution um, was the elevation of individual human rights and personal autonomy as the centerpiece of of a new way of thinking about national sovereignty. That, that national sovereignty wasn't just a leftover uh, artifact of previous wars and empires, but was actually um, defined by uh, the human being at the center of our definition of governance and, and sovereignty. And the seeds were sown uh, for this concept in, in the UN Charter, of course, but also most importantly in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which I always encourage people to read whenever you get a chance. It is a very inspiring document and very much reflective of, of US values. 
And I wanna read two excerpts from the Universal Declaration that I wanna talk about in the course of this evening uh, that are relevant to today's situation in particular. First, that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. We constantly need to be reminded about that in our current political situation. And secondly, that the authority of government depends on the will of the people as expressed in periodic elections, universal suffrage and secret voting. So let's shorthand free and fair elections, right? So those are in my mind, the two key pillars coming out of the Universal Declaration. And what's interesting is that this, th these norms, many others like them, were have been adopted by every single government in the world, regardless of political regime. So the whole concept of human rights has great power that you have such a, a diverse group of countries and traditions accepting and, and, and embracing the, at least the idea um, and the ambition of these uh, human rights. So ever since we have been waging, ever since 1947, a very contentious battle over who can do what to the people living within their borders and how and when to intervene when things all too often and always will go horribly astray. So you mentioned Myanmar, obviously a, a good example, North Korea, the Balkans, Afghanistan, Venezuela, Rwanda, Libya, and the list goes on, where that tension between non-intervention principle, we don't intervene in other people's sovereign affairs, um, and this newer concept of a responsibility to protect, that we have as human beings a responsibility to intervene when governments are slaughtering their, their people, right? So Rwanda, of course, comes to mind, but also, of course, the Holocaust. And the United States has been the leading authority and champion for the view that democracy, human rights, rule of law, together, it's the only legitimate system of government. Um, and it really staked its claim for global hegemony, um, both during and after the Cold War, and on a bipartisan basis, by the way, as the defender of these norms. And this was the case, let's be honest, despite not living up to these ideals in practice at home, um, and moreover, while abusing human rights and undermining democracy abroad in the name of defeating communism or defeating terrorism or whatever the case may be. Um, so you think of Chile, Pinochet, Guatemala, overthrow of Arbenz, Iraq, and uh, others. So now with the end of the Cold War, the Clinton administration tried to close this gap between rhetoric and reality by turning away from covert wars and coup mongering toward this concept of democratic enlargement, that we are as a national security imperative, not just as a nice thing to have after you do everything else, but as something that was critical to our own national security. And in one form or another, most administrations have followed suit in that, in that course until Donald Trump arrived on the scene. And I'll say more about that later. Um, then, of course, the dissolution of the Soviet Union opened the door to dramatic changes in Europe, uh, where a much deeper commitment to democracy, human rights, and rule of law really became consolidated. And you see this manifested in a whole set of binding treaties, and you have an expanded European Union incorporating Central and Eastern Europe. They're now, you know, right to travel and work across as citizens of Europe and a, a robust European Court of Human Rights. So a really dramatic example of the collective determination and will to create this multi-state pooled sovereignty around concepts of, of democracy and human rights. And they're actually putting some teeth on this concept. Um, you see backsliding and we've documented in our work uh, in Poland and in Hungary. And so Brussels is stepping up and saying, wait a second, you are violating the very principles of the European Union and they're litigating over it. And now they're starting to withhold major sources of money to these countries uh, until they clean up their act. Um, so that's a really interesting development to watch. 
Um, so you see this Europe whole and free, it's very much a work in progress, but I think in a, in a positive track. Um, so now let's bring it to today. And we see these issues in stark relief with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, um, illegal, immoral, um, and it's really such a powerfully resonant conflict right now because it engages these two strands of international order that I mentioned earlier. The traditional notion of national sovereignty and respect for borders, which Russia has totally violated. And um, second, the more, this more modern version of sovereignty uh, that is derived from popular will as expressed through free and fair elections. So as, as imperfect as Ukraine's democracy is, um, particularly in the area of corruption, there's little doubt that it, it was on the path to uh, really improving adherence to these principles of democracy and human rights and more open government, more citizen participation. It was on the right path. At Russia, on the other hand, is headed in exactly the opposite direction, uh, which is why this is more than just a territorial conflict over who controls territory in Eastern Ukraine. And I know you heard a little bit about this from my colleague Fiona Hill from Brookings, who um, spoke to your group in the fall and is really a really important voice and, and leader on these issues. But if, in my mind, for a lot of other people in the West, this is the time to draw a line in the sand uh, because these bigger principles are at stake. Um, does a country have the right to intervene um, militarily or can Ukraine live uh, independently and be responsible for its own destiny? Um, so, you know, when you see what Russia is doing at home and denying their citizens their own rights and now trying to impose that on their neighbors, um, there's a lot at stake. And of course, there's a lot more than that, but I'll just, on this topic, leave it at that. And, and encouragingly, the United States and NATO and the European Union are responding as I think they should. Uh, based on this much stronger consensus in favor of collective action to defend democracy and the rule of law. And importantly, not letting Putin get away with this. I would set a very, very bad precedent. Um, so what I've just reviewed in this kind of first part is the good news. Um, and yet, let me turn to some other issues. Um, overshadowing all this drama is, of course, communist China. And I intentionally put the word communist before China because you cannot understand modern China without understanding the sanctity of one party rule in, in Beijing, especially under Xi Jinping. Um, and so despite the various ways that China has opened itself up in the 90s and 2000s, there's no question today in my mind that China is bent on controlling its own citizens and projecting power around the world in ways that ensure its own system of Lenin and governance becomes the favored, if not the dominant model for others. So it's no longer China saying, we'll take care of our business, leave us alone. It's China now saying, no, we want others like us all around us. And I've been studying this question the last few years, China's behavior in Latin America, China's behavior at the UN, particularly on human rights. And you can see the shift where they've gone from defense to offense. And they're trying to actively woo others into their corner um, and undermine some of the basic World War II, post-World War II points of consensus. And I find that a very dangerous uh, development. So I can give you several examples. I also am not tracking my time. So, um, I see that I've already talked quite a bit. So I will not go into great detail, I'll just give you one example. Um, they have claimed that state-led development is superior to individual human rights. And, and so their model is really first and foremost more important than uh, our definition of, of human rights. Not just our definition of human rights, but the definition that every country in the world has adopted to underscore that. Um, and because they've amassed so much economic power and influence in the world, they're able to win over 
allies um, or even the fence sitters who are at key moments going over to China's side at the UN and in other, in other ways, including when China is committing cultural genocide against its own people, the Uyghur Muslims, uh, and many states, including many Arab and Muslim states looking the other way. So I think that is something that we should all reflect on and be concerned about. Taiwan then becomes even more important because when you think of it in the Ukraine situation, Taiwan does not have the same sovereign status as Ukraine, but what Taiwan does have is a very strong uh, record of democratic legitimacy at home and, uh, and human rights. China does not have that. So it's a very interesting competition between those two on those grounds to, to pay attention to. Now, I also have a lot of data here and I have a couple of um, books that I can share with you from the World Justice Project. We produce the Rule of Law Index, which is an annual accounting of how states are performing on a whole set of factors around the rule of law. And we do this with primary source data, a set of surveys and uh, questionnaires to both households average people and to experts and practitioners. And so over years, we can see certain trends. And what we're seeing is um, some really serious concerns. Um, for the fourth year in a row, more countries have declined than improved in their rule of law uh, records. And in the last year during the pandemic, we saw very serious declines in many areas including constraints on government power. So this is evidence of the rise of authoritarianism um, and a, re, re, a decline in checks and balances. We see declines in fundamental human rights around political assembly, rights of expression and freedom, um, major delays in delivering justice to people, both civil and criminal. Obviously the pandemic closed a lot of courtrooms, um, but also rising discrimination. Um, and uh, unequal treatment of minorities and, and different types of classes of citizens. So those are the current trends in most countries in the world right now. A lot of backsliding going on. Um, so now this brings me to part three of the story, uh, which is the very alarming decline of democracy and the rule of law right here in the United States, the purported leader of the free world. And I, I wanna be clear, this is, not just a partisan issue. There are deeper problems in our society than just one man uh, or woman, uh, but it's something that is really staring us in the face. Um, I would say that the trends have gotten worse under the four years of the Trump administration. And we're now, in my view, at the point of a five alarm fire. Um, we have an unparalleled crisis in fundamental principles that I talked about before of equality and of free and fair elections. And, and I think to put things in perspective, um, let me just so, tell you in our index, we also include, of course, the United States. The United States has continued to decline over the years. We're now ranked 27th out of 139 countries. Um, so another decline from previous years. I won't go into all the other data points, it's, it's in there, um, but you see it in particular on constraints on government powers, on um, respect for fundamental rights, um, the, the rates of discrimination in our civil justice and criminal justice system, it's real. You compare it to other countries in the world, we score very badly. If you look at um, discrimination in the civil justice system, we rank 122nd out of 139 countries um, and similar ranking in criminal justice. So I think the last several years have really taken their toll and the, the bitter polarization of our politics, the lack of trust in official sources of information, now, I think this is one of the reasons President Biden was compelled to convene this first ever summit of democracies last December as a way to kind of underscore the urgency of the challenge we face um, here at home and, and abroad, but we have a, a really long ways to go. So at this point, I think we have to talk about January 6th. Um, it's front and center, of course, at the House hearings. Um, 
But if you think back and look at what we know so far, um, we have a, a clear attempt by a sitting president who refused to accept a certified electoral defeat and a willingness to break the law and provoke mob violence in order to prevent a lawful transfer of power to the winner. This has never happened in our history. Um, and that's bad enough. And we survived this, what I consider an attempted coup by the skin of our teeth. I mean, I can't believe how close it got. But I also think that what has happened since January 6 is even worse. I mean, the failure of the Republican party to clean house and instead reward Trump and his allies with a platform to continue to promote the big lie and support and elect candidates who are determined to undermine public trust in our elections and inter even interfere in independent ballot counting. I mean, the story today about what was going on in Georgia and other states, I, I think this is kind of the original sin of any kind of rules-based democratic order that we can't even agree on how to count votes and make sure people have access to the ballot. So of course we have other problems. Um, we see the rise of extremists and racist voices in society. Um, and I, I feel sometimes like we're in a bit of a death spiral. I, it's hard to see how we get out of it. Um, and then of course the misinformation, the social media, um, we're, in, we're in bad shape. Okay, so. I really will wrap this up in a minute. So after, after my 35 years of working to promote democracy, rights, and rule of law at home and abroad, I've never, I've never felt more pessimistic. And if the United States cannot get its own house in order, it, how can we be a force for good in the world, uh, or let alone live in a, in a free, pluralist, tolerant society? So that's the, the sad part of the story. Um, Again, let's remember in our own lifetimes, we've seen real progress toward equality for all. I was very impressed at the, the stone markers out front of this church in the own local reckoning with slavery in here in Old Lyme. And I think that's a very healthy sign that we're addressing our, our past. Um, and we need to continue to take those kinds of corrective measures. Um, but we're also seeing a really ugly backlash to even those efforts. At, at the global level, I, I've just returned from The Hague where I hosted something called the World Justice Forum. And we convened over almost 700 activists and experts uh, from around the world to talk about what can we do? What can we do to strengthen the rule of law around the world and justice and what works? And we had some really inspiring change makers and we have an award competition uh, prize for the ones that are doing the most impactful work. So you see what's happening in India where a small group of women got together to prevent violence in their neighborhoods by crowdsourcing data on where it was safe to go and where it was not safe to go. Um, there are examples from Ghana where a small group of lawyers and justice advocates created a digital platform to help prisoners um, with their appeals process. Um, Ukraine, there was a, a process for making uh, procurement systems more transparent. So like good work to make government uh, better. And I think it's inspiring and it's the kind of work that we should all be doing uh, in our own lives. But it will always be unfinished business. It, it's always up to us to get involved and to try to make a difference. So I just wanna, in closing, quote uh, one of our speakers at the forum, um, Sherilyn Eiffel, who is the head of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. And she delivered uh, the Ruth Bader Ginsburg legacy lecture. Um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a regular attendee, a speaker at our forums. She said, I'm encouraged by how many people around the world are committed to justice, equality, and the dignity of human beings. There are more of us than there are of those on the other side. Now we need to show that at this critical time in our history. Thank you. Yeah, so um, I wanna remind folks on Zoom that you can post your question 
uh, in the chat and we'll read it or you could even put your hand up and you could maybe speak, I think. Um, but anyway, but let me start uh, in the room here. Um, anybody got any questions? Here we go. Um, I think it's inherent in the business of foreign policy and diplomacy and our national security that we're, we will always be hypocrites. It, 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 there's no such thing as a, you know, maybe Norway or Sweden or some other state, but I think there will always be tensions and contradictions in our behavior, especially as a superpower. Um, the question is where we have a, a margin of maneuver, where we have choices to make on whose side are we for in different scenarios, confrontations, et cetera, whose side are we gonna take? And are we going to lean toward supporting, for example, the return of democracy in Venezuela? Or are we going to look the other way and just pretend like it didn't happen and embrace Maduro before him, Chavez? Because guess what? We need the oil. We're in a gas crisis and we've got to make some compromises. And the Biden administration is facing that dilemma right now. So there will always be a tension. So where does that lead you? Do you say, well, if there's always going to be contradiction, you're a hypocrite, then just stop playing and just, you know, do it the way you are, naked self-interest, right? And I, I don't think that's who we are. I, I don't think that's who we are as a democracy and as citizens trying to, not only, I've done a lot of research analyzing whether democracy really creates more security. Are democracies safer and more secure as societies than non-democracies? And I looked at it from a point of view of crime, from a point of view of gender violence and a number of other factors. And what I found was, yes, there's a very strong correlation between Democrat, liberal, strong democracy and those other elements of security, including peace, by the way. But the messy middle of weak democracies, transitioning democracies, they're actually the most unstable. So authoritarians are stable and relatively better at security, the strong democracies, and in the middle is a mess. And that's where a lot of this tension happens and where the U.S. has a lot of choices to make. Yes, um, so we had some... From the Zoom? From the Zoom. Great. Um, I'm sorry. Actually, the members of Zoom have asked to repeat that question mm. so that they can understand. <laughs> okay. In well, he might. Right. Okay. So that was basically um, how should we frame our foreign policy when we're dealing with un unscrupulous individuals. Um, I, you so anybody else in the room, questions? Anybody online? Not so so I, I, I have a question. Um, and I'm afraid I have to disagree with you, Ted, because Good. I am not a very um, uh, hopeful about the situation. And I'm not sure I agree that uh, and I'm, you know, 32 years in this country, I voluntarily came to this country. I, well, some could say maybe I didn't voluntarily. There was nothing much going on in the other country I left at the time, but there certainly is now. But I think the U.S. was a wonderful place to visit. The problem to, to live in, the problem I think that that I hear in Europe and, and from friends is that the U.S. talks out of both sides of its mouth. Now I I know what you mean when you say. We shouldn't throw our hands up and say, well, look, yeah. we, we should just be pragmatic and whatever. But equally well, we can't play both sides of it. So the example, I think, is the dreadful debacle in Iraq. And, and, and that, has, that, that has set back 
a lot of people's view of America's role in the world. Yeah. I actually don't even think President Trump is even that big a deal. Mm. That's more to do with national politics, but mm. from an international perspective. Mm. And, and, and while I am all for uh, um, helping particularly young women in places like Afghanistan, I think what happened in Iraq and, and Afghanistan was so poorly handled. And I, and I don't mean that the last weeks of exiting, because yep. that would have been a mess no matter what. I mean, the entire, the whole process, and, and that went through both sides of the aisle, presidents from both sides. And it just mm-hmm. speaks to a sense that America thinks it knows what's best for the world. And, Amer- and the rest of the world is saying, yeah, well, that's what you think. And, and so uh, another example is, is American support for Ukraine. Mm. And, and you've heard this argument and you've all probably heard this argument. Where were we helping Syria and where were we helping other countries south of the equator? Or we're flying over ourselves trying to help Ukraine because they're blah, 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 white and European, mm. sort of. So, so how to convince me that um, genuinely it's worth believing that America is good for the world. It's good for America, but good mm-hmm. for the world and, and, and this difficulty of, of playing both sides. Yeah. Well, you've, you've put your finger on one of the hardest issues um, or two issues, Iraq and Afghanistan. And we've made many, many grave mistakes. And I was a very vocal critic of the way the Bush administration handled Iraq. I mean, it goes against the whole idea that you're going to impose democracy at the point of a gun on another society. That's fundamentally anti-democratic. And, uh, you know, even though bad things were happening in Iraq, we way overstretched. And you're right, we didn't understand the society and completely messed it up. And it gave a very bad name to the whole idea of democracy promotion. And so living and working in that space in Washington at the time, we were all completely deflated and depressed because it it set back the whole agenda by decades. So we agree on that. Now, why we don't agree is on the Russia-Ukraine piece, because as I tried to argue, there's something else going on besides blonde, blue-eyed people in that country. Um, I think part of it, it, it's an echo of the Cold War and our own antagonism with Russia uh, that is coming back. And that's a natural instinct for us. But, you know, as I tried to argue, it's you have an independent sovereign state that was democratizing. And that in itself was seen as a threat to Putin and his own ambitions for return to the Russian empire. That has to be stopped. Like to me that you have to stop now. Does it mean we militarily invade? Uh, we're sending weapons to Ukraine and training. Uh, that's a good start. I don't know. We'll see how far it goes for us to stop Russia. But I think Russia does have to be stopped because otherwise you are creating a huge uh, precedent that's going to be a problem for us for a long time, including thinking about China. Right. And, and actually, I, for those of you who remember, we did have Stephen Wall visit Mm. Uh, quite a few years ago, <laughs> um, uh, and you know he's a very uh, distinguished uh, academic, and you know he's not a he's not a um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for pullback um, isolationist. Uh, and, and Stephen Ward, I'm, I'm hoping to get in the fall, mm. uh, and, and Peter Biden. They're not isolationists. Mm. They're just saying we need to be careful how we prosecute our foreign policy. And I I used to be all for liberal democratic internationalism. Great, send the message abroad, get these countries, lift them out of their whatever. I mean, Ireland for 50, 60 years was virtually a theocracy and it ran itself into the ground and it finally got itself organized. Mm. And so I'm for that sort of thing. But God, we have to find another way to do it because otherwise it's just, we're just gonna lose our way and it's gonna be worse. Anyway, not, not for me. Anybody else in the room? Oh, yeah, here we go. All right. Uh, among 
people who believe that the 2020 election was stolen, do you have any hope of changing any minds, or uh, is, is that a naive idea, or, or have there been any instances you've seen of tools or strategies that could convince people of a better career? Yeah. I, I think it's it's down to like hand-to-hand -hand combat unarmed um, would be the way to go. The, we have to be much more organized and involved in these local races, even for obscure positions like county clerk and secretary of state. Most people didn't even know there was such a thing as secretary of state until last election. And, and I think right now, um, one party has their act together in pushing that agenda and the other really doesn't. And so that's part of where it has to be fought because we, we do have rules around elections. Uh, by the way, I've done, if you compare our election system to most other democracies, we have a terrible election system. Uh, most countries have independent electoral bodies that are the final authority on how ballots are counted. And if there's still a dispute, it goes to the Supreme Court. That's typically the way it works. We have a very decentralized system with multiple actors and it leads to a lot of confusion and really unequal access to the ballot depending on where you live in this country. It shouldn't be like that. We, sh we should have a national system in my view. And so, that's unfortunately baked into the constitution and our federal system, and that would be hard to change, but I think it is something we should look around and see what other countries are doing and learn from them and be not so like we always have the answer. Anybody else? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I heard, I think I heard the tail end of the news story recently that Texas was now talking about possibly becoming its own country again. And it, and it got me to thinking of a lot of talk that I've sort of heard around the edges of like, you know, we should have let them secede. The whole, and like, do you honestly think that, I mean, that could be a solution because of the extreme polarization in this country? There's other gridlock in Congress. And like, I see no other answer besides just like two countries are too big. Well, I mean, I think there's always perennial talk about this idea of Texas seceding and they kind of carried around as a badge of pride, but I, I don't really see that happening. I mean, to be... like not just Texas, like, oh, like well, the, the red states and the blue Well, then, great. Then there's like, there has been talk about California. It should just become its own um, country as well. Um, I, I do think that we've got enough of a nation state identity that we will stay together as a country. It's what, what worries me is um, the civil rancor and lack of trust in our citizens, let alone common sources of information. What is fact and what is fiction? If we can't even agree on that, we're in really deep trouble. And that's why I'm so pessimistic right now. Unless we start getting a handle on the explosion of lies through social media that people are buying, we really don't have much leg to stand on. So teachers, educators, schools, uh, you know, getting young people to understand that and diversify and become smarter at the news that they analyze and read, which by the way, is not the newspaper anymore. It's barely even TV. It's just what's on their phone. And so it becomes harder and harder to do. And, and I honestly, I, I wish I knew the answer to this other than a lot of hard work and maybe it's time to regulate these companies um, with some standards and norms that we can enforce because we cannot leave it to companies that have a business model that depends on propagating lies. That's how they make money. And so that's gotta change. That's called capitalism. <laughs> Run amok. There's also some recent talk uh, in the wake of the West's collective action against Russia that Russia might try to create their own alternative G7, mm. um, the likes of Russia, China, Iran, Mexico, uh, India. Um, you know, so many of which, not all of which, but many of which potentially authoritarian, authoritarian leaning, mm -hmm. but also likely to be prominent economic global actors over the next hundred years. You know, in, in, in a global context where historically a lot of the multilateral institutions have, have shared um, American values, generally speaking, do you see a risk that um, 
these authoritarian, authoritarian leaning countries start to coalesce into a larger global block that leads to a bigger conflict between democracy and authoritarianism. So I, I, yeah, I, a small risk, but not a serious one. They've tried this in the past. What's different in the last year is you see this very much stronger um, common ground between Russia and China. And that is what's different and worth watching. But in terms of their ability to pull others along with them in a meaningful way, like take India, for example. India, India will not align itself with China. Um, there's way too much antagonism between those two countries. And you know, Iran is an interesting one, but how much economic weight do they really have? Mexico, I would not see that happening. I mean, the current president of Mexico, leftist, um, likes to poke at us all the time, but at the end of the day, um, they're way too tied in and integrated into our economy. They would not survive that kind of sharp uh, cutting off of, of ties with us. Um, so I'm, I'm skeptical. Uh, that said, I think the, the kind of um, coherence and coordination on financial and economic policy that we've seen over the last several years has actually been more positive than negative in my view. And um, the way we handle the pandemic um, and the other recent recessions, I think is, is actually encouraging. There was some macroeconomic policy coordination and what Janet Yellen's trying to do um, uh, on some of the currency issues is really important. Uh, and so we'll see. Now the Russia thing, it takes us off in a different direction. Um, so maybe, maybe not. Uh, I, I want to ask you about Europe. You talked a bit about Europe. Um, I would have said before uh, Russia invaded Ukraine, I was very concerned about where Europe was going, mm. not least of all because of the B word, Brexit, mm. but also Hungary and Italy got a little wobbly there at one stage. Mm -hmm. um, remarkably, I think Europe has sort of pulled together, although the Germans are gone wobbly again, so it's hard to know. But, but you've got a country, and as most of you know, I pay close attention to what happens in Westminster, but you've got a country now that has not only left the European Union uh, with, you know, 51% of their borders saying yes, but they're now considering leaving the European Court on Human Rights because mm -hmm. they want to send illegal immigrants to, and folks, you may know or not know about this, to Rwanda. So somebody gets the whole way from Syria or somewhere to Britain, they get put on a plane and, and that just about got stopped. But there's a sort of, a, there's a, a break up in some ways in Europe that is concerning. I'm sure President Biden is doing a better job of bringing it together and Putin <laughs> inadvertently. Where do you think the future for yeah. Europe and, and European Union is yeah. vis America? Then? I agree with most of what you said, except for a couple of things. So Brexit was really unfortunate, and I think they're going to pay for it. The United Kingdom already is paying for it. And, you know, that was their sovereign decision. Um, it'll be contentious for a long time. They're wrangling over the Northern Ireland issue as well. Um, kind of a mess. And... Um, that is what it is, but I don't think, and then coincidentally, the Ukraine-Russia thing has done what you said, really brought the other European democracies together. Now, Germany, where I got a chance to, to live and work, has made some really important shifts in the last year toward a much more engaged and, and leadership role that um, in, the, in the direction of support for collective action on behalf of democracy that you didn't see as much under Merkel who was much more get along with Russia in her approach. So I'm actually encouraged by Germany's shift, um, even though, yes, it's a little wobbly, but it's much better than it was. Well, it's, more, it's more wobbly about delivering the weapons. The military, and right. This gets back to the delivering the weapons and whether they're defensive or offensive. Right. And you, know, you mentioned earlier about how much are we going to help the Ukrainians? Well. We're, we're, the reason we're not helping the Ukrainians as much is because we're afraid Putin has nuclear weapons and he's liable to do something crazy. 
other than that, we would have given them everything they need already. Well, and the energy is stored, yeah, you know, it's course. very important. Um, and they are shifting. I mean, to, yesterday I heard a story about Germany having abandoned most of its coal plants in the name of climate change are reverting back to coal because that's how they, that's how they can, the only way they can survive cutting off Russia gas imports. So um, some funny results of, of all that that are, are good and bad, but I'm generally, as you heard, I'm pretty bullish about Europe um, in this concept of collective action by democracies. And I've been spending a fair amount of time over there. What I see in Brussels and in Luxembourg and in Strasbourg, a construction of a federal European system that's founded on principles that we would all feel very comfortable living with, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. And they're really building these institutions and putting teeth behind it in ways that is actually, frankly, from a boring legal point of view, it's actually pretty exciting. Um, we went and visited the... European Court of Justice in Luxembourg and heard more about what they're doing there in this approach. And it, it's really striking. Well, that's, that's great news, very positive. Um, and unless we have another question in the day. Oh, never mind, I do. <laughs> I was going to say we'd end on that, but no, we yeah. won't. Let's keep going. <laughs> it's going to get even broader. Um, it's been a lot of over the years about the UN either fundamentally overall fundamentally overhauling the UN or coming up with some kind of system, an alternative system. And I, I feel like I've read a few times over the last few years, it's like, okay, this, this is clearly the version of this is if the UN is broken, it's, it's just, it, it's never really worked that well, and it certainly doesn't work well um, as currently constructed. So I'm wondering if you've heard of anything or you yourself have come up with a design to, to solve uh, world problems like the UN. <laughs> um, yeah. The United Nations is a creature of the member states. It can only do what the member states want it to do. It doesn't have enough power of its own, the Secretary General and all the other agencies uh, to really make a difference. It's, I've always been struck, I've been working with UN Development Program for this meeting we did in Europe and they are so timid about the member states. You know, they, they just don't want to cross them in any way, shape or form. So as a result, it becomes kind of a mushy nothing at times. Now, maybe that's good because compromises happen, negotiations happen, we design treaties that aren't enforced. So that's a problem. There's some success stories. Environmental law would be one where we have banned certain chemicals through international negotiations and that's being enforced or at least it's being respected by states. So I, I, I think we just have to be realistic about what it can do. And it, it can be a force for good. Um, we all as Americans have a good image, uh, not all, most people about UNICEF, for example, and they do really important work. The head of the World Food Program just spoke at our forum and he is out there. He's a former governor of South Carolina, Republican who is sounding the alarm about the hunger crisis in the world right now, which is getting much worse with the Ukraine-Russia war. And it is scary what he told us. And I think that's an important role that the UN can play. It's like, hey, we're looking at things from this global level and we can connect some dots here. You guys gotta wake up and pay attention. So I think that's good. I was gonna reference the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, the former president of Chile in the context of China. So Bachelet is a pretty strong, strong advocate for human rights, but I gotta say she sold out to the Chinese in some way. She walked into a state managed propaganda trip to Beijing and didn't get to meet with any of the Uyghur Muslims, highly criticized by the human rights community. And now she's not gonna run for a, a second term. So, you see actions like that, and Antonio Guterres has been a disappointment. It's just, it's an impossible job, but it, at the end of the day, what I think needs reforming is the Security Council. It is time to enlarge the Security Council. We need to bring in Japan and Germany, maybe India, maybe Brazil, I've mixed thoughts about that. But these are countries that have contributed to the international peace and security since World War II in very important ways, and I think they, belong on the Security Council. And this would perhaps, and also you could, um, when certain actions involve, say, a veto member state, they, they don't get to exercise their veto. 
particularly like the worst kinds of human rights abuses that yes they would have to and, and amend the un charter which has to then be ratified by all the member states it's a huge complicated undertaking so maybe the you it's good to think of the un as a child of world war ii and maybe growing up and that home and now we need a new version uh, of the un so there's been a lot of talk about um, and when I was at the State Department, we launched something called the Community of Democracies with Madeleine Albright. And the idea was to create much more cooperation among democracies. And others saw it as an attempt to undermine the UN or create this alternative UN. And that created a big problem for us because countries were like, we don't want to participate in that. We like the UN. We, we don't want to be part of this club, even though we're a democracy. So that's, and then there were the anti-UN folks in the US who loved the idea. It's like, yes, we finally, Albright gets it. We want to get rid of the UN. So you get into those kinds of battles. Do you have any more questions? I just have one question. It's sort of, sort of off topic, but not really. I'm thinking you talk a lot about the science being more generally And um, so I'm thinking about the role of women in, in all, all of these events. Also, thank you again about your life <laughs> and, um, and what she's doing right now. And do you see any hope for um, for women making a difference in some of these arenas? And if so, what do you see? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, this is one of the the, the question is the role of women in international affairs and, and how are we going to improve our democracies, et cetera when half the world's population is somehow not equal in depending on your criteria. Um, you know, what's going on in Afghanistan right now is, is so tragic on this front. And it really pains me that we tried and failed completely um, to get that country in a different course. And the Taliban won. And, you know, when we were in The Hague, we had a group of musicians from, this isn't a gender issue, but just to mention it, uh, the Taliban has prevented people from playing music, the traditional Afghan heritage music in the country. And they are fleeing and they're regrouping in Lisbon and they came and performed for us. And it just brings home this um, constant battle. The US can only do so much in correcting. But on the gender issue, so my wife, um, Susan Gibbs works for a foundation in which um, they do a lot of work on reproductive rights and uh, women's health. And what we don't know that much about in this country is, but it's prevalent in other parts of the world, is female genital mutilation and other ways in which women's bodies are invaded. And um, lots of really important cultural changes are happening in traditional tribal societies that have been dominated by men to wean them away from this practice. And it's a combination of men and women who are reaching agreement to do this. And it starts with young girls and getting them in safer places with the agreement of the fathers most of the time, because otherwise it's much harder. And so that's exciting to see that shift bit by bit. But then you also learn when you start digging under like the, the memory stones out front that this was a practice in the United States. It was called different things, but we have our own history on this. And Susan's own family has experienced it 100 years ago forced sterilization. So I think this is a part of our constant self-education that we need to reckon with our past and move toward some kind of parity, equity between genders and in many other criteria. So maybe that's a note to end on. It's more work to do, let's get to it. Let's, yes, <laughs> let's end on a positive note. And, and let me say, that for all my negativity, I am hopeful because there's people like you out there speaking <laughs> and, and traveling and meeting with other international uh, organizations. So thank you very much, Ted, for coming to all lines this evening and speaking to SECWAC. Thank you, Brian. Oh yeah, so if people want to grab any, I just have a few copies, they're out in front here, if you're interested in comparing how the United States ranks on rule of law and getting into the weeds, there they are. Thanks.
What? <laughs> uh, somebody in, in Zoom. This is fabulous. <laughs> One would take Good, please do. Line. Yeah, and the small, the, the small one is a summary of the big one. Oh, so, the, okay. So I should. Yeah. Do one of that. Yeah. So it's free. Yeah. And of course, it's on the website too. Please. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So so